Good afternoon, everybody. In this presentation, I have a task that is in some sense impossible because I have to explain a complicated business to you. So I'm going to aim for three simpler goals. The first one is I'm going to try to enable you to identify when a property that you might encounter in some form or fashion is one worth learning more about for purposes of potentially doing uh, a recapitalization or tax credit transaction. Uh, secondly, uh, in addition to when you should get alert, I'll try to give you a sense of what you should be alert for. And third, in as much as I can, I will try to make it possible for you to be less confused by all of the jargon in our industry. Um, it's a secret, but we in the industry use jargon to keep outsiders out and to make fun of people who don't speak it right, and I will try to minimize the extent to which you are susceptible to that. So, the first thing that you need to understand is that to enter this webinar is not unlike turning on Game of Thrones at the beginning of Season 5. There are hundreds of players with different particular roles, and they all operate on basically one principle which everyone knows and no one admits, that the deal is a device to produce fees, and that housing or improved housing is a useful byproduct. Um, there are four major families or households. There are something called allocators, which I'll talk about briefly. There are developers, for-profit and non-profit. We have captured two of them and present them here for your edification. There are investors, and I will extend that to include lenders and capital providers. We have one of those. And there are intermediaries. Now, LIHTC, first thing of jargon, you have to pronounce it LIHTC. Pronouncing it any other way casts you as an outsider. Comes in two flavors. One is allocated, sometimes called 9%. And one comes out of volume cap bonds. It's sometimes called 4%. For your purposes, the simplified thing to know is that if you win a LIHTC allocation, that represents, for our purposes, basically free money for 55 or so percent of total development cost. And if you win a volume cap allocation, as a, as a bonus prize, you win about 25% of development costs. Now, those are not additive. You can only have one or the other with respect to any dollar of, of, of investment. And the thing about the light tech business today is that like Game of Thrones, things are tough. Light tech is incredibly scarce. Volume cap is plentiful. So here's your first indicator. If you see a of opportunity to gain volume cap, you should perk up because most states can, can give it away. Next, deals, raw material is scarce. Syndicators, an intermediary not present on this call, are plentiful and sad to relate, developers are plentiful. And what that means is that syndicators and developers are on a hunt for deals, for LIHTC, and for volume cap. Okay. This is a slide that you will want to look at later when you download the PDF. Basically, there is a life cycle of deals that begins with a pre-intelligent state and ends with a poor schlub humped over a computer attempting to uh, calculate whether it's time to do a recapitalization. The dates on the left-hand side represent the beginning of construction. So you will see um, the beginning of occupancy you will see in step five that I've labeled that year zero. I'll come back to that. That moment, occupancy, the fifth step, the fifth phase in the life cycle, is actually when the tax credits start to flow. And everything that happens in the previous stages represent the development finance that brings the capital in in order to trigger the tax credits. Once you get to the occupancy, several other things happen, and I will jump ahead to step seven, which is that in year 15, that's a term you're going to hear about again and again, in year 15, you can go redo it. Before step five, there are four steps that you will hear talked about. 
there is something called a QAP, which is a qualified allocation plan. It's created by a state. It exists to say, we have this free money to give out. Would you like some? Here is what we want. Typically, that will be established 24 months before occupancy of a project that gets developed under that QAP. About six months later, the allocator will pick the winners from among the applications. About three months after that, there will probably be a closing where that allocation of tax credits gets sold for cash. I'm sure our developer types will talk about that. Then there will be a closing where lots of papers are signed and intermediaries get paid fees. And then in round numbers, over the course of 12 months, plus or minus, the property will be developed, renovated, uh, it will receive its certification, and it will eventually get its certificate of occupancy, and that brings us back to step five. It's important to note that most people will divide this into the first four phases, which are the development phase. Phases five through seven are the holding period phase, and seven and eight represent the, gosh, this was just so much fun, let's do it again and recapitalize. And the reason this chart is so important is right now in these United States of ours, for all practical purposes, if you don't get LIHTC, you can't make your, day, your deal work. So everyone who plays in this space is acutely conscious of the QAP cycles, the volume cap cycles, the price of credits, and so on. Okay, now, next thing you need to understand is that most of what we're is dealt with, and, and for our purposes, since we're dealing with recapitalization, you're dealing with things that are obsolete. Uh, the picture that you can see there um, actually represents an actual developer at the time he did his first deal in 1974 when he was a HEP cap. And many of these folks still own their same transaction, somewhat remarkably. Um, it's also important to understand that, of course, just as the glasses are bad, the mustache is bad, the leisure suit is bad, there's a variety of reasons why that old property needs to be redone. And so when you find something that looks anachronistic, that's your second tip. If it looks like it's out of date, think of it as raw material for an upgrade. Now, affordable housing finance. I've dealt with people from the conventional world a lot who, sort, who tend to look down their nose at affordable housing finance because somehow that they feel like it's not real macho real estate. Well, actually it is. It's just more complicated for less money. The government intervenes in much the manner of a chaperone by both protecting the customers, meaning low-income housing tenants, um, the customers and the taxpayer, and by assuring that those people get a rent bargain in some form or fashion, and I'm sure our developers and our lender will talk about that. So inherent in tax credit is the idea that there's a rental advantage. Now, if you have are going to have a rental advantage on one side, on the other side, the government provides resources to make up that lost economic value. So what the government taketh away with its left hand, it giveth with the right hand. And the government being a large Frankensteinian kind of entity, the left hand and the right hand don't always work together, so sometimes the numbers are better and sometimes they are worse. Meanwhile, there are three periods of time that I alluded to in the previous slide that I will allude to again. From and after occupancy, for the first 10 years, the investor is getting the benefit. That's the delivery period. Okay, 10 years of delivery. From year 10 to year 15, there is a period of time where no benefits are being delivered, but there is a potential for recapture of credits if the owner violates the rules. By year 15, that recapture has dropped to zero. So from and after year 15, the investors are no longer motivated to be in the transaction that we will deal with their exit in a second. However, at a minimum, to get this 10-year cookie, which we're going to turn into cash through syndication, you must sign a 30-year extended use agreement which means that between year 15 and year 30, the project has certain characteristics of a zombie, at least the limited partners do, because they are indifferent. Some use agreements, as in California and elsewhere, go out 55 plus years. 
the relevance of that is that even though they go out that long period of time, it is still possible to do a new tax credit transaction because there will normally be a certain amount of headroom in the deal. Lastly, to go back to our delightful picture up there, every one of these transactions is custom tailored. He didn't buy that off the rack. That uh, was designed for him to fit his specification. The capital stack, as I'm sure our lender will talk about, is incredibly complicated. Every junior lien that gets put on, every junior financing has a mortgage or a collateral associated with it. It gets very complicated and just like that leisure suit, not only does it become out of date, it doesn't fit anymore. And so by year 15, it's time for custom tailoring, which leads to the next important idea. Preservation development is never permanent. In the grand recapitalization hotel, people come, people go, and we do it all over again. Because it is a reality of a residential real estate that these things need an upgrade every 10 to 15 years. But I just said a moment ago that the capital stack that we're dealing with is very inflexible. So to do the upgrade, to change the physical configuration, you must put new financing in. And remember, the last 15 years, we've had the broadband revolution. Before that, we had the microwave revolution. Also in the last 15 years, we've had green and sustainability. We've had a continuing fragmentation of what constitutes the nuclear household in the United States. That matters because that means we have different subcategories of tenants and different floor plans we need. The other thing that happens in 15 years is that markets rise and fall. So what was a good affordability bargain when we wrote those contracts is no longer a good affordability bargain. It goes back and forth. Meanwhile, in the 15 years, partners change, incentives diverge. The investors, most of the investors who consume those tax credits don't exist anymore because they were banks that were bought by banks that were bought by other banks that were bought by Bank of America and City that were recapitalized um, by TARP and here we all are again. So there's a lot of stuff in the bank's garage. Uh, general partners, uh, whether they're corporate or individual, age, change focus, change capacity, become crotchety. Lots of things become obsolete. And the change of the accumulation or amortization of loans, the hard loans amortize down, soft loans accrete up, means that nothing fits anymore. So as somewhere between year 10 and year 15, it becomes increasingly necessary from the real estate's point of view to do something. But not everybody gets that. I've been describing the tax credit model. The tax credit doesn't cover all the properties in the United States. My best estimate is that we have between four and five million units that have some form of affordability covenant. And many of them are, for our purposes, orphans. And here's another place for you to watch for things. If you see a property that is physically obsolete, nine times out of uh, affordable property, public housing, HUD, uh, nonprofit, whatever, if it's physically obsolete, nine times out of 10, it's because it has over-engineered financing. And it has a use agreement that doesn't work anymore. And it has enforcement mechanisms that are toothless because of those zombie limited partners I talked about. And the incentives of the general partner and the limited partners have become misaligned. Lots of people are demotivated, and despite all that, they're barriers to exit. And you say, gee, that's a lot of fun. And here are the cons. Legacy public housing used to be an orphan until the rental assistance demonstration program got created. There are 1.3 million units of legacy public housing. Only 180 plus thousand of them are currently in RAD, but even though that's a tremendous amount, that leaves a lot behind. If you ever encounter something called a Section 202 elderly, they would, these would have been built in the 60s and 70s. The residents will be, uh, have lived there pretty much the entire time. The board of the 202 will be older than the residents. That's a candidate. RHS stands for Rural Housing Service, with the artist formerly known as the Farmers Home Administration. They had a program called Section 515, and very few of those have been recapitalized. And they're interesting because you can become urban without moving. What was a suburb 40 years ago, or the countryside, is now part of the Los Angeles glob. There are HUD projects, there are post-preservation projects with unpronounceable acronyms, ELIPA and LIPRA, and there are LITEC deals done 15 years ago and LITEC deals done 30 years ago. And all of these properties need to be adopted, and if you remember from the first slide, deals are devices to produce fees, that means a fee opportunity. So, 
What do you want to be? You want to be legitimate. You want to be capable. You want to be durable. You want to be scalable. You want to be smart. And you want to have friends who can give you resources. So preservation has become the preferred acquisition strategy for many a developer, such as Michael's. Um, it's convenient. You can do it with other people's money. You get a new round of development fees. You can re-syndicate your own deal. What fun. Um, you have to buy the property from the current owners for a price that gets negotiated. You can partner with housing authorities. That's the RAD business. We talked about that. I should mention that our company, Recap Advisors, was the pioneer in RAD. And I'm pleased to report that our head of RAD, uh, Tom Davis, uh, recently transitioned from Recap Advisors to be head of the Office of Recapitalization at HUD. So he went from Recap to the Office of Recap. Um, and we're currently negotiating with HUD the amount of royalty they get, they pay us for the trademark infringement. You can also buy trouble. I have made, I have created wealth consistently by buying stuff that other people would pay you to take over and then fixing it. Yes, that takes risk tolerance and speed. It works. You also have to find juice. You have to find some form of resource to close the cost value gap. And there are a variety of those. And the popular sources of material right now are old public housing via RAD, stuff that never got touched by the tax credit in inventory, which is reaching year 40, and those post-preservation projects. Now, if it were easy, everybody would be doing it. And instead, it's a marine-style obstacle course, where whatever doesn't kill you earns you your development fee, we think. First problem, getting a deal that is viably priced. Some folks I know will look at 100 and run the numbers on 50 before they get one that's viably priced. Many things are listed by real estate brokers, and they get priced up. So if you want a buying advantage, you have to find situations where real risk is less than perceived risk. Next, you have to win LIHTC, um, which means you have to know what the QAP says. Uh, indeed, you may want to try to influence the QAP because it's published prospectively uh, for public comment. Um, and in most states, demand for LIHTC outseeds supply by three to one. To file an application that has a chance of winning costs a lot of money in third parties, and the winning deals have to pay for the two losers. So this is a barrier to entry. Um, selling the light tech is a challenge. It's not really a barrier to entry, but it can be bewildering because everybody wants to buy your deal. Everybody says they can promise things. Everybody discovers that the market moves while you're negotiating it. It's very easy to get frustrated. Um, even with all of that, you will have to find some soft debt. And I will not go into this because I anticipate our developers were, will. There will be a listing of a development fee uh, in the sources and uses, but you will become familiar with something called a deferred development fee, which is an IOU from yourself to yourself. And with that, I will turn it back to Keith and back to the first developer who succeeded in doing this.